squeeze in tighter if you don't mind. Three rows is fine. Okay, well, y'all, thank you. Uh, welcome again. On beautiful, beautiful day still, uh, still here. I we'll call on Captain Jason Strong, Chaplain. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. I invite you all to join with me as I pray according to my faith. Gracious God, I humbly beseech you today uh, to be with those as they have been affected by Dorian and those that will be in the path that will be affected. I ask that, God, that you would cause uh, Dorian to bring out the best of what South Carolina has to offer, both in her people and in her leadership. I thank you, Lord, for the, the leadership of the state. I thank you for those state and local agencies that stand ready to support and help uh, the people of this state. And so I humbly beseech this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. John Quarello, National Weather Service. John. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. The risk of life-threatening storm surge and hurricane force winds continues to increase along the coast of South Carolina. As of the 2 p.m. advisory from the National Hurricane Center, Hurricane Dorian was moving very slowly near Grand Bahama Island and has wind speeds of 150 miles per hour, making it a very powerful Category 4 hurricane. Dorian will begin to track northward very near the Florida east coast tonight into Wednesday, with the forecast continuing to indicate passage just off the South Carolina coast late Wednesday night and Thursday as a dangerous Category 2 hurricane. Even with the forecast track offshore, Dorian will be expanding with impacts extending well away from the center, which will result in the potential for significant impacts to parts of South Carolina on Wednesday and Thursday. Any change to the track farther west, which is certainly possible, would bring with it greater impacts. The most significant impacts from Dorian will occur along the coast, where the risk of life-threatening storm surge and hurricane force winds continues to increase. Rainfall amounts of 6 to 10 inches or more could result in flash flooding across many coastal areas. Farther inland across parts of the Midlands, breezy to windy conditions will occur with a storm, along with some rain showers, although the heaviest rainfall should generally remain east of the I-95 corridor, uh, unless there's any significant changes to the track, of course. At this point, it's important to not discount the threat Dorian poses to South Carolina and to follow the recommendations of any local emergency managers. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> well, Hurricane Dorian, as we know, as John Quirello just told us, is Category 4 hurricane, so it has decreased some, as you remember, is 185 miles an hour before Category 5, but sustained winds are still over 155 miles an hour. The latest forecast still has South Carolina in the path of a very destructive and deadly storm. <coughs> and I remind everyone, and we say again, all of us, if you are in one of the evacuation zones in the counties along the coast, the eight of them, then it's time to believe is, is now, if you're still here, to be safe. We know that we can't make everyone happy with these actions and these orders. We know some people may be inconvenienced, but this is the best way to keep South Carolinians alive. It means getting out of the way of this dangerous storm. Today's lane reversal on I-26 has gone very smoothly so far. In fact, the Department of South Carolina Department of Transportation and Department of Public Safety were able to open the eastbound lanes in Charleston to westbound traffic an hour and a half earlier than anticipated. We were going to do it at noon, but ended up doing it at 10.36 this morning. That is the traffic coming from Charleston up towards Columbia. Uh, why did that happen? It started at about 6 o'clock this morning. The Department of Transportation began noticing a dramatic increase in the volume of traffic that was heading westbound, that is towards Columbia on I-26, and has over doubled the number of vehicles on the normal day. This confirmed what we had anticipated, that is, Labor Day weekend tourists and coastal residents evacuate the coast at the same time. That is, that would, would have created gridlock and brought westbound traffic to a standstill possibly for, for hours. So, by doing the lane reversal in Charleston, coming up I-26 towards Columbia this morning, 
an hour and a half early, has traffic moving, moving smoothly and safely from the Charleston area towards Columbia. And this, this here, as you see this picture, this is, these are the lanes coming towards Columbia. This is the, normally the lane going to Charleston. Of course, it's open coming this way. You see the traffic on it, there's a lot of traffic. This is right at, uh, let's see, it, uh, exit 149, 149 South, South Carolina Highway 33. This is just outside of, of Orangeburg, but you can see the, see the traffic on there. Uh, as for Highway 278 in Beaufort, which is the road leaving uh, Hilton Head, similar increases in the traffic leaving Hilton Head were noticed this morning. State and local agencies are now working together on the reversal there and are adjusting their arrangement as traffic dictates. For right now, it's running smoothly on 278 leaving Hilton Head. Secretary Hall and Director Smith will provide additional details, specific details about that traffic. As for school and government <coughs> closings, as you all know, the schools and state <coughs> government offices in the following counties are closed tomorrow Tuesday, September the 3rd. Those are in Jasper County, the eight counties, the coastal counties, Jasper County, Beaufort County, Colleton County, Charleston, Berkeley, Dorchester, Georgetown, and Ori. Those are the only counties in which we have ordered the schools and state offices to be closed. As of now, those are the only counties that we will <coughs> order to be closed tomorrow. Later days, we'll, we'll make those decisions later. But for schools and state government offices in the remaining 38 counties, other than those eight, that are, those that is, they are not under an evacuation order. I repeat, in every county that is not under the evacuation order, there will be no executive order issued closing schools and government, off government offices for Tuesday, September the 3rd. Why? Because at this time, we don't need the shelters that would require the schools to be closed, because that's where the people are sheltered. Everyone is getting out and they're driving through Columbia. Many are going on up to Greenville and Spartanburg and it, it appears that we will not need those schools to, for shelters. So everything is running smoothly. <clears throat> as soon as we have information, we will give it to you. And I, I say again, this, um, this process, you have, many of you know the, the people that work on this that you see in, in the room today. This is a highly experienced team, but you never can tell where a hurricane is going to go. There are people all over the world trying to predict this hurricane. What we do is we assimilate, we study that information, we act uh, accordingly, and our team has had great success in people keeping the people of South Carolina safe and alive, and we're, we're delighted to be able to perform that function. So. At this time, I'll ask Major General Van McCarty of the Adjutant General to come forward. Thank you, Governor. Uh, the South Carolina National Guard has approximately 1,000 soldiers and airmen that are currently deployed to support the evacuation. Uh, most of those are assigned now to work with the Department of Public Safety and the Department of Transportation in executing the uh, evacuation that the Governor has described. We also have military police that are working with the State Law Enforcement Division to help provide security in the affected area that is being evacuated. Uh, we're also working with our partner states, with the states that we normally have uh, an exchange of resources with through an emergency compact. Uh, we're working with them to determine what their needs may be, what ours may be, and based on the storm, uh, we may have uh, resources that go to help, help other states. We may in turn have resources come in to help South Carolina. We're also working with our federal partner to monitor the Title 10, the active duty assets that are being positioned in the region to support the states that are being affected by Hurricane Dorian and we're working with those to determine those needs. We're also looking to see and monitor uh, what may be the next phase of the operation for the Guard and we're assessing that and have those units on standby to be called up as necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Christy Hall, Secretary of the Department of Transportation. Thank you, Governor. The DOT's main focus today is, is basically traffic management and continuing to prepare for the storm arrival. Uh, as the governor already mentioned, we predicted yesterday that we would see increased traffic on our evacuation routes, particularly uh, I-26. And as we expected, that, that did come to pass early this morning as, uh, as we predicted. 
uh, we, we're seeing volumes roughly double what we traditionally see on I-26 as early as 9 a.m. this morning, leaving the Charleston region, region heading up towards Columbia. And due to that uh, increased traffic flow, we uh, consulted with our partners with DPS and other local law enforcement to accelerate the implementation of the reversal in order to meet that increased traffic demand that the system was experiencing. Uh, as the governor mentioned, the first cars were able to get on the reverse side of the highway uh, nearly an hour and a half early at, a, at approximately 10.30 a.m. with those first cars arriving here in Columbia on the reverse lanes at approximately noon, having traveled that 96 mile uh, corridor on the reverse side at good travel times and good speeds. We continue to monitor the I-95 and other areas of the uh, evacuation zones across the state. I-95 northbound traffic is actually a little bit lower than normal. However, our southbound traffic is approximately 10% uh, higher than traditional volumes. With regards to uh, the Buford area, as the governor mentioned, we are seeing higher than normal, excuse me, the Hilton Head area, we are seeing higher than normal traffic volumes in that area. However, uh, with the, the reversal is in place and functioning very well. We, we were traditionally seeing about 40% higher than normal volumes uh, on US 278 leaving that area. So with the reversal, we're able to provide three outbound lanes from the Cross Island Parkway to Moss Creek Road, a distance of approximately three miles to, uh, to get the traffic to the Bluffton Parkway so that traffic can separate and go two different directions at that point in time. Just like we did with I-26, we were monitoring the, uh, the hourly traffic volumes on 278 and we also recognized early that we were experiencing some congestion at the Cross Island Parkway. So we went ahead uh, at 9 a.m. this morning and went ahead and lifted those tolls effective at 9 a.m and opened all five lanes at the Cross Island Parkway to outbound traffic to clear any congestion that we were experiencing there. In the Myrtle Beach area, we continue to see higher than normal traffic patterns as we would anticipate with a storm like this or with an evacuation on top of a Labor Day holiday. And we continue to work with local law enforcement and DPS on uh, developing whatever tools in the toolbox we need to deploy to keep traffic moving there. I want to speak just a few minutes about I-26 and the reversal to provide a little bit of clarity to uh, folks that are interested in evacuating on I-26. If you're in Charleston, Mount Pleasant, West Ashley, North Charleston, or Somerville, you can get on the reverse side of, I of I-26 at the I-526 interchange. That's where we want you to load. If you uh, are not able to get there and want to ride the traditional westbound lanes, there are four options for you. You can get on I-26 westbound at US-78, which is the 205 exit, 17A, which is 199 exit, Jedburgh Road, which is exit 194, and the SC-27 exit, which is a little bit higher in Ridgeville, that mile mark of 187. So really five ways to get on the I-26 to head westbound out of the area towards Columbia. If you are on the reverse side, if you're on the reverse side of I-26 heading towards Columbia, you have eight opportunities to exit before you get to Columbia. There's eight interchanges that are open and available for you to use. So you can get off and get gas, go to your final destination, <coughs> or, or get refreshments. Those exits are in Ridgeville, Bowman, Orangeburg, and Sandy Run. Those are the exits that, that will be available to you prior to getting to the uh, I-77 area here in Columbia. So ample opportunity to get on the reversal and the evacuation route. And if you're on the reverse side, ample opportunities to get off and do whatever business or your final destination is. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, ma'am. Director Leroy Smith, Department of Public Safety. Thank you, Governor. Our total law enforcement and National Guard staffing for emergency support function 16 remains at 2,700 
85. As the governor mentioned earlier, I-26 and US-278 lane reversal operations are underway and flowing very well. Also, we'd just like to remind the uh, motoring public of some safety tips in terms of uh, evacuations. Uh, know your designated uh, evacuation route. Uh, you can go to scemd.org or scdot.org for further information on that. Uh, be patient. Uh, some evacuation routes may be at maximum, maximum capacity and it could take you longer to get to your respective desti destinations. And third, be prepared. Ensure that your vehicle is properly serviced with a full tank of gas, have an emergency kit that includes snacks, foods, water, care items for kids, medication, toiletries, extra cash, flashlight, <coughs> and a cell phone. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. Your next, <coughs> Mark Keith, your Chief of SLED. Good afternoon. Uh, in co coordination with local law enforcement, uh, we currently have 370 other state law enforcement officers from SLED, DNR, Triple P, uh, SCDC, and then as the general stated earlier, we'll have 50 MPs from the National Guard that will be joining this effort uh, to support local law enforcement tomorrow. State law enforcement uh, will begin providing assistance and has already began providing assistance to local law enforcement agencies. We have uh, started receiving requests, additional requests, uh, to help them as this evacuation process takes place and we will be moving these law enforcement officers into those areas that have been evacuated. We have SLED's uh, aviation assets are also available to assist both with traffic management uh, during the evacuation and also to assist in any law enforcement uh, issue that may arise in the affected counties. Lastly, I want to say this. Each time this happens, people evacuate these areas uh, for their personal safety. I want to remind everyone that if there are individuals out there that choose to take advantage of this situation and try to break into people's homes and steal from those who have left their homes for personal safety, you will be arrested and you will go to jail. Let me repeat that. You will be arrested and you will go to jail. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Rick Timmy, Director of Department of Health and Environmental Control. Thank you, Governor. Yes. <clears throat> Yesterday, the Governor issued a mandatory medical evacuation order for the health care facilities regulated by DHEC in the evacuation zones. DHEC is currently in communications with 175 health care facilities impacted by this order. This total number includes 13 hospitals, 25 nursing homes, and 92 assisted living facilities. The four hospitals that have begun closing are Hilton Head Hospital, Encompass Health Rehab Hospital of Bluffton, Palmetto Low Country Behavioral Health, and Vibra Hospital of Charleston. The nine hospitals that have been granted exemption waivers allowing them to shelter in place, <coughs> these hospitals are still expected to reduce their census, to discharge patients that can be safely sent home, and cancel elected procedures. The nine hospitals that have been granted the waiver are, in alphabetical order, Beaufort Memorial Hospital, Bon Secures St. Francis Xavier Hospital, Coastal Carolina Hospital, East Cooper Medical Center, Encompass Health Rehab Hospital of, of Charleston, MUSC Medical Center, Mount Pleasant Hospital, Roper St. Francis, Roper Hospital, and Trident Medical Center. Our call center, the Caroline 1855-4SC DHEC, opened at 8 a.m. this morning to answer questions from our patients and women and infant and children's clients. Governor, thank you. Thank you, sir. Mayor Leach, Director of Department of Social Services. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor. Uh, the South Carolina Department of Social Services is designated as the lead state agency for coordinating mass care operations. Working alongside our partners uh, in the American Red Cross, Salvation Army, Department of Health and Environmental Control, other state agencies and volunteer relief organizations. 
This includes providing staff to support shelter operations across the state as well as coordinating the supply of food and bulk distribution of emergency relief supplies. In accordance with Governor McMaster's order of evacuation, South Carolina currently has 13 shelters open across the state to meet the needs of evacuees. This includes 13 general population shelters, of which 12 are utilizing schools. We have zero special uh, medical needs shelters currently open. As of 1.20 p.m., we have a total population of 15 individuals in our shelters. The number includes, uh, of, of the 15 individuals, those are in general population uh, and zero current medical needs clients. We have 10 general population shelters on standby and 21 medical needs shelters on standby. Our current total capacity is 9,385 and we are at 0% of that capacity. So we still have 100% of total capacity available um, and at this time zero shelters are full. Um, at this time we don't see the need for uh, uh, capacity for shelters in the Midlands area but as the governor said we will reevaluate that um, as, as time goes on. Thank you Ms. Leach. Emily Farr, Director on Labor License and Regulation. State Fire, the division of the Department of Labor, Licensing, and Regulation, has been working around the clock um, with firefighters across our state to make sure that we have all search and rescue assets and resources that we'll need to respond to this storm. Um, the Palmetto Incident Support Team, that's our in-state team, has been working since Wednesday to strategically plan for what resources those might be and what we'll need um, given different scenarios of the way this storm has been tracking. We continue to prepare for that most likely worst case scenario for those search and rescue needs. Um, we've recently just brought in members from Louisiana's incident support team. They are here and integrated with our team to help with that strategic planning. Um, already we have here or coming to Columbia by tomorrow morning 20 swift water boat teams and three type 4 um, USAR teams to help with search and rescue. And I want to thank all of our fire departments and firefighters across the state that have stepped up to help fulfill these resources and be ready, standing ready to be deployed wherever we may need them once the storm um, hits. Meanwhile, we're also continue to coordinate with FEMA in mm -hmm. case there are additional resource needs that we may need um, to deploy. Thank you. Thank you. Kim Stenson, director of this office. Thank you, Governor. Uh, here at the State Emergency Operations Center, our uh, current priorities have, haven't shifted too much, but it's still evacuation and sheltering operations right now, but we're also looking for, towards uh, planning for the initial response uh, after we start to see the storm effects, the damage assessment, uh, eventually re-entry, and then recovery. We currently have uh, 16 county emergency operations centers that are operational. We have eight at OPCOM 2, Operating Condition 2, which is an enhanced readiness, and then we have an additional eight at OPCON 1, Operating Condition 1, which is uh, maximum readiness, uh, similar to what we are right here. Their primary focus is also evacuation and sheltering operations right now. Uh, we're starting to get some requests in from the counties, but we haven't had really very many, but they've been ranging from sandbags to transportation. We expect that to uh, ramp up here over the next few days. And we still have uh, our personnel from South Carolina Emergency Management Division deployed to the counties uh, as liaisons to uh, maintain situational awareness and assist them in any way that we can uh, then at the local level. Uh, logistics, uh, our Winsboro warehouse uh, is uh, fully stocked and is ready to transport uh, food and water as required. Uh, all our logistics contracts have been activated, uh, ranging from commodities to general logistical support. Uh, to transportation. We've got 75 buses that have been uh, staged in Orangeburg uh, in the event that the local authorities need any assistance with the evacuation. Uh, and then I already mentioned some of the out-of-state coordination under the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. Uh, we've got the uh, Tennessee uh, team coming in today to help us with any, any requests that we have. And we've got two right now that are somewhat active. Uh, Director Farrar already mentioned the Advanced Incident Support Team uh, that's, uh, that's working with, uh, with her team. And then we're also in the process of requesting some additional air support. 
Uh, FEMA, uh, we had the uh, federal emergency <coughs> declaration that the governor requested uh, was approved uh, late last night, and that'll allow us to FEMA resources, uh, DRICS federal assistance, you know, ranging from incident management teams to, uh, to transportation. In the public assistance area, again, we the key message there is for all our <coughs> citizens to be their own emergency manager and have a plan uh, and know if you're in an evacuation zone and what your plan is to do when you evacuate. We've got our website at SCEMD.org. We've got the 2019 hurricane guide, and we've also got our South Carolina mobile emergency manager app that will help you with all that. In particular, uh, on the <coughs> website and uh, on the uh, mobile app is a, a section called Know Your Zone, and it allows you to type in your address, and then it will tell you if you're in an evacuation zone, and then it will tell you what evacuation zone you're in. And uh, also, lastly, uh, our state hotline was activated this morning, also known as the public information phone system, and that's available if you need any evacuation or sheltering information. Uh, and the number is 1-866-246-0133. It's up on the screen, and Spanish interpreters are available. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, Governor, yes, folks on the coast have been making remarks about uh, whether this might be too early or not, uh, what response would you have? Well, the people have been trying to predict hurricanes for years, and we're at the peak of scientific expertise and technology now, and we still cannot predict where a hurricane is, is going to go. Uh, as you know, you, you see, if you've seen, the, they call it the spaghetti chart, where different organizations around the world predict hurricanes, and it looks like a plate of spaghetti, because you have people with with the talent and all the equipment in the world, including satellites in the air and uh, thermostats in the water, and they still cannot predict them. But we are, pre we are hoping for the best, prepared for the worst. Uh, the best thing in the world would be for that hurricane to take a sharp right and go out to the ocean, and we would all celebrate, because it could take a sharp left and come in shore, in which case so we would go into overdrive and continue doing what we're doing. But we'd rather be safe than sorry and we know that uh, any time we issue orders or take these measures, uh, it is to protect the lives of the people of and in South Carolina, and we do whatever it takes to do that. Have a question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. As far as our fuel for this state, do you have any information as uh, how do we stand? If yes, ma'am. We're in good shape. Right? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we have um, sufficient... We have sufficient gasoline supplies for uh, evacuation. Uh, the last stats that I have, um, we were showing through Gas Buddy, uh, roughly 96% for the state. If you looked at just the coastal areas of Myrtle Beach, uh, Charleston, <coughs> and Savannah slash Hilton Head, it was around 93%. Do you make arrangements with the gasoline companies to bring in extra fuel for any, something like this? We stay in constant coordination with um, the, our, we call them our fuel partners, and whether it's uh, Speedway, Circle K, we have a list statewide. There's over 2,000 plus gas stations in the state of South Carolina. Question. Director Smith, you guys uh, tweeted a, a video of some cars crossing the lane, the median. Can you speak to that? Are you guys trying to combat that? And what's your message to people there attempting to do that? First and foremost, uh, please uh, just stay within your respective lane of travel. Uh, crossing the uh, median could be very catastrophic because there's uh, tr cars traveling in the same direction. Uh, so we would uh, caution folks uh, not to do that. We will work with our partners over at the Department of Transportation to put out uh, messages uh, in that regard, too. Secretary Hall, um, I know with Hurricane Florence, you guys, Department of Transportation, deployed um, some kind of new devices to help mitigate some of the flooding on those major roads. Are you guys doing anything, anything like that for this storm? If required, absolutely. Uh, part of what we're also doing, besides dealing with uh, managing traffic, is sort of that look ahead, trying to anticipate what our needs are three plus days out. And so we are uh, currently doing a, uh, an analysis on our critical infrastructure. Uh, where there may be uh, storm surge or flooding or low-lying areas and what mitigation measures we may take. Still a little early on that. Uh, as the governor mentioned, with the unpredictable nature of the storm, we still need to get a little bit refined data coming in, and, and then we'll take the appropriate action at the right time. But those tools are still in the toolbox, absolutely. Questions? 
What's your best guess now on where the hurricane might come ashore in South Carolina? Where's John? John Farrell. Yeah, at this point, we're not expecting landfall in South Carolina on the current forecast track. However, it wouldn't take much of a, a shift to the left to bring it very close or onshore in South Carolina. So right now, there is no prediction for a landfall here in the state. But again, the, the current forecast only shows it passing about 50 miles offshore. So that's that's not very far at all. And and just a slight change in that forecast track could dramatically uh, increase the impacts that we see early. <coughs> so landfall means is the eye of the hurricane Actually moving in right. touch the coast. Right now it's out in the ocean, as you can see from that prediction so far. Any more questions? Yes, Governor, sir? what's your message to people staying on the coast and not evacuating, thinking the models are showing it staying in the ocean? Oh, uh, Not smart. Uh, it's better to be safe than sorry. And we don't want to be telling anybody we told you so. So we would say be safe, get away from the coast. The predictions are we're going to have wind, water. That hurricane can go one way or the other, nobody knows. Uh, so be safe. And just to be, just to be certain, and to circle back to an earlier question, you have no doubts that you have started the evacuations and the lane reversals at the appropriate time. You don't think you jumped the gun? No, sir. Not too early, not too late. We did it just right. We followed the procedures and made the judgments we made in countless hurricanes, five in the five incidents in the last five years. And we've had five of these in a row. And this is what our experience tells us to do. And most of the people that you see here that represent the various agencies have been through all of this. So this, this is our best judgment. And again, we do not want to gamble with a single life in South Carolina. We do not gamble with lives. Governor, yes, what other lessons have you learned from previous storms? We've had quite a few in the last few years. What other things are you taking from that experience to now? Well, one thing, it, it, it's wonderful to have a, a, a federal administration that we can call on. It's wonderful to have other governors, other administrations, other offices we can call on. It's wonderful to have the kind of talent that's available, scientific, technical uh, talent. And also it is, it is terrific to work with uh, Team South Carolina, uh, and the representatives of which uh, many that you, you see here, the county people are not here, but there's a lot of experience, a lot of talent uh, involved in this. And uh, we have learned that the best thing always in everything is to communicate, collaborate, and cooperate. And it works every time it's used. Governor, for those that decide to stay, what's the status of the pharmacies in the, um, in the evacuation areas? Are they going to stay open? It has an answer to that. We can get you an answer to that later. Okay. Do you have an answer to that? I'm pretty sure that uh, many of them are going to be closed. Uh, because of the evacuation order. So uh, if they choose not to close, then they violated the evacuation order, so they may not be open. Governor McMaster. Yes, sir. Uh, over the last few years, the lane reversals have been a pretty big trend before that, for years before that, hadn't really been a big focus, um, hadn't had to do it that much. Has there been a sense that this has gotten, I don't want to say easier, but more routine over the last three, four years? Well, we certainly know how to do it because we've done it a number of times. <laughs> and we know that it works. And this this, uh, this today is is an excellent uh, demonstration of how, how well it worked when it was uh, sensed that the traffic was increasing uh, almost double at 6 o'clock this morning. Uh, we were able to uh, open those lanes from Charleston coming towards Columbia and, and, and on up uh, an hour and a half earlier than, than planned. And as you saw, the first cars were getting to Columbia about the time we originally planned to open those lanes in Charleston, so it worked on a smooth as silk. Thank you, Governor. Also, regarding uh, this lane reversal operation, this is something that we do with our state partners uh, basically year-round. Uh, as we said before, uh, we, we plan together, we train together, we conduct exercises together, and as you see today, we executed the plan together. So it's something that we are very cognizant of is something that we work with our state partners basically uh, year-round to make sure that we get it right. Thank you. Secretary Hall, do you have an estimate of how many cars, how many vehicles are on the uh, I-26 right now headed for Columbia? Or how many per hour? What sort of number do you, can you put on the traffic flow? Well, we're still a little early in the reversal, um, but from looking at the video, it's obvious that it's very well used currently. 
uh, the last data that I looked at, which was uh, the first two hours of the reversal, we were seeing approximately um, 5,000 vehicles uh, utilizing both sides of the I-26 heading up. So that would equate to per hour. Um, so that would equate to approximately uh, about 10 to 11,000 uh, uh, people utilizing the um, the uh, westbound heading up towards Columbia. So it's obviously from the video, it's very well used. Uh, it was definitely needed. There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that if we had not implemented this reversal that we would have gridlock on I-26. So um, Director Smith and the team and the locals deserve a lot of credit for being able to quickly react when we noticed the, the trends and how they were going to accelerate that implementation and keep things moving. So uh, congratulations to the team. Go ahead. Go ahead, Governor, I was wondering if there are any comparisons that are being drawn between this hurricane and Matthew uh, a couple years ago and sort of what lessons are being Well, every, every hurricane, of course, is different. And uh, we, we've experienced floods, we've experienced winds going all the way back to Hugo. We really experienced some winds then. Some of us go back way beyond that. But everyone is different. But the best, the, the main lesson we always learn is to be prepared. And not only do the government agencies at every every region, every level need to be prepared, but the citizens as well. We live on the Atlantic coast. We are going to have hurricanes. We've got to be ready for them. Going yes. back to 2015, obviously all eyes are on the coast right now with this storm. Is anything or has things been done here in the Midlands to kind of mitigate what we might see with potential flooding going back to what we saw with Hurricane Joaquin? Well, we don't anticipate that kind of flooding in 2015 that we had. That we had, had then. That's not anticipated. Any more? Thank you very much.